I invite you to take a Bible, your Bible, one in front of you, and open up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 13. Gospel of Luke. This is like the 60th time I've invited this church to open up to the Gospel of Luke. And that wasn't an exaggeration. Now, I know some of you read the newsletter. Some of you delete my newsletter without reading it, okay? Some of you did read my newsletter and came prepared for me to say, open your Bibles up to the chapter 14 of the Gospel of Luke. Um, that will be, Lord willing, in the future, okay? Sometimes my plans change, which leads me to my first illustration. How many of you would say this past week, plans you made did not happen the way you planned them? Testimony? And thinking through my week, I have to say maybe, maybe one day happened the way I planned it to happen. The appointments I think would be at this point end up being 12 hours later at this point. The day I thought I was going to get this, this, and this done, you wake up feeling sick and you only get one thing done. The plans you make change with one phone call and all of a sudden you realize that's not going to happen anymore. Life's different. In fact, I've had a laugh this week in thinking through one truth for this passage in Luke 13. And this upcoming week, we are planning a work day for Saturday. My struggle is we have no clue what seven subconscious are going to get done this week. So we really have no clue what this week's going to be. I have no clue what room we're going to meet in next week, what this building's going to look like by next week. So it's not just that I can make plans and my plans sometimes change. There's sometimes in our life that we can't even make a plan. Now take that thought, our inability to make plans, or how so often our plans completely go down the drain. And consider God. God has a plan. It has been the same plan from eternity past before the before creation ever happened, he had a plan. He had a purpose for his creation. It's been one plan. And throughout all of creation and all of God's word, we see the constant unfolding single plan of God. God creates. His plan unfolds. God promises. God promises a child to two elderly individuals and his plan unfolds. God gives a promise to a king in a little nation far away. And God's plan unfolds. Now, on one track, you see God's unfolding plan, but as you read through God's word, you see that there is also this constant attempt to derail the plan of God. God creates, it's good. In comes a snake. Let me undermine it. God plans, God promises, in comes unbelief. And we see a constant play attempting to derail what God has planned. But over and over again, we see that God's plan cannot be derailed. Whether it's a snake in a garden or a wicked ruler that wants to murder the entire race of Israel or a corrupt king who orders for every baby boy, three-year-old on down to be killed. You see a constant attempt to derail God's plan. But over and over and over again, we see God's plans cannot be thwarted. God's plans can't be derailed. If God has planned it, we know it will happen. See, at the end of Luke 13, there's about five verses. Admittingly, they are rather odd verses. 
if we just picked random passages to preach on a Sunday morning, there are five verses I think that we would skip over pretty easily. Because between these two verses are really impactful, clear passages. I mean, last week, narrow gate, salvation is narrow. Next week, we get this beautiful picture of humility. Yet here we have five verses, and admittedly, they're rather strange. I mean, within these five verses, a Herod wants to kill Jesus. Pharisees of all people warn Jesus, and Jerusalem once again shows its unbelief. Read with me. Luke 13, verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox. That's, that's not a compliment, okay? Go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today, tomorrow, and the third day. I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today, tomorrow, and the, third, and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until they, you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those verses, along with the entirety of God's word, leads me to make one statement a gazillion times this morning. That I hope the Holy Spirit drives into our hearts. God's plan cannot be derailed. And before you just simply say, well, sure, Pastor, God's plan can't be derailed. And you can see it any number of places in Scripture, God's plan can't be derailed. There's an aspect for us this morning that I'm praying that this truth, God's plan cannot be derailed for some, will provide amazing comfort. Because what you're experiencing right now in life is so easy for you to begin to think that this is some sort of haphazardous, there's no way this can be good experience. And I want a statement that says God's plans cannot be derailed to bring comfort into your life to say what I'm experiencing is part of God's plans because God's plans can't change in my life. And therefore, since God is good, I know this is part of his good plan. But a statement that says God's plans can't be derailed, I hope, brings comfort. There's times where, I mean, we look around us. It's not just our own life. We look around us and we see the world and we see conflict and we see oppression, we see suffering and we see things just falling apart in our minds. And it's so easy to begin to think, this world is out of control. No, God's plan can't be derailed. My God is in control. Or what about the person this morning who is wrestling with choices and decisions and big ones. Where do I move? What job do I take? Where do I go? I mean, big decisions, but they become so crippled. They want to honor God. They seek godly wisdom, but they're so scared that they're going to take one little step away from God's plan and completely derail God's plan for their life. God's plans can't be derailed. To know the truth that God's plans can't be derailed is comforting for my heart. It's strengthening to say God is in control. It's praise producing. My God's plans can't be destroyed today. We're going to give you two statements as we walk through the passage. We've got five verses. Two statements about God's plans not being destroyed. But then, before you check out, we're going to do some hard work. Because we're going to take this passage and, and apply it into our life with some statements. From the passage, first one, verse 31. God's plan cannot be derailed by mankind's power. God's plan cannot be derailed by mankind's power. So, question, you've already read the passage. Who would you say is some of the most powerful individuals in Jesus' region right now? 
I mean, maybe Pilate goes on the list. There might be some unnamed Roman centurion, whatever kind of guy that has a lot of power. But I would contend Herod has to be on the top of the list of the most powerful people in that day. Herod has the power to kill. John the Baptist is testimony of it. I mean, John the Baptist is dead right now because Herod makes a foolish promise to a niece during a, a, a party. And now John the Baptist is dead. I say this because if this passage unfolds, and here's this news, Jesus, Herod wants to kill you. This isn't just Herod doesn't like you. This is the most powerful individual in that region wants you dead. So humanly speaking, you don't have a lot of time to live. I mean, if Herod wants your head, he gets your head. He, Herod doesn't have to go to Congress and say, hey guys, I want to go kill so-and-so. Can you guys take a vote? Yes, no, do I have that authority? He's allowed to do it. He's king. I mean, his dad, Herod, had the authority to murder baby boys three years old on down. And there was no revolt. So does Herod have the authority to kill one guy causing some ruckus spiritually for people? Yeah. Now I need to ask, answer a question. So we're going to just a little aside. Because if I don't answer this question, I think about 12 of you are going to come up to me afterwards. So I'm just going to do it right now. Some of you read this passage and said, okay, so I understand Herod wants to kill Jesus. Makes perfect sense. Why would the Pharisees warn Jesus that Herod wanted to kill him? Like, is it like, to me, that's like the Pharisees getting exactly what they want. They want Jesus dead. Herod's going to do it. Check that one off the list. Let's move on to something else. Like, why would they come along and say, Jesus, just got to tip you up, okay? Herod's out for you. So you might want to do something different. Okay. Valid question. Luke doesn't tell us. There's just no answer. So I say that because anything I do right now is just kind of us attempting to fill in the blanks of the passage to help us understand it more. I mean, maybe the Pharisees are warning Jesus that Herod wants to kill them because it's one of those kind of things like common enemies make good friends temporarily. They don't like Herod any more than Jesus or anybody else does. I mean, he's, he is not Jewish. He is wicked. He's oppressed the people. Maybe siblings, you understand this picture. Um, Big brothers thinks he's allowed to tease little brother all he wants, right? But if some other person comes along and teases little brother, what does big brother do now? And some of you guys don't even have good big brothers. You let your, come on, you don't let your kid's get, brother get teased. It's almost like, I can do this, but you better watch out if you get him. So maybe this is a play here. Like, okay, we want to get him because, I mean, we're Jewish, we're going to take care of ourselves. But here, you better not step into our ground. Or, or maybe, it's, um, maybe it's just really pragmatic. If we tell Jesus Herod wants to kill him, then Jesus is going to leave here. And if he leaves here, it's not our problem anymore. I don't got to deal with it. It's another town's problem. Some people like to think that um, maybe it's, um, well, it's deceptive. It's setting up for a trap. They know in Jerusalem there's a Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin can take care of Jesus just fine. So let's kind of move him towards Jerusalem. Now, ironically, Jesus is going to say, I'm going there anyway, okay? So you don't have to trick me to get there. Herod wants to kill Jesus. But Herod's not the first person who's tried to kill Jesus Christ. Herod's not even the first Herod who wanted to kill Jesus Christ. I've already referenced it, Herod the Great. So this Herod's dad, I know that there's a lot of Herods, okay? This Herod's dad gets news through some wise men that says, I want to find out where the king of the Jews has been born. And this very fearful, panic-stricken king sends out orders to kill, to slaughter babies in an attempt to derail God's plan of providing a king of the Jews. Was Herod the Great successful? 
Not even close. That's not even the last time that Jesus has attempted to be killed. We were here, um, Luke 4. You can turn, or I'm just going to put on the screen here. Luke 4. When they heard these things, so this is, this is the town, this is the crowd. They heard these things from Jesus. All in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so that they could throw Jesus down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he, want, he, he, he went away. Now, wait a minute. There, there are some times where I wish, I wish Scripture came with like, like video clips. <laughs> right? What does it look like to have a mass mob drive Jesus outside of a city with an attempt to push him over the cliff, cliff and then like Jesus just walks away? Like I, my imagination, I freeze everybody. They're just kind of like stuck. And like Jesus just passes on through and then he's gone and they get unstuck and they're like, where did that guy go? I have no clue. Except I know they attempted to derail God's plan. Were they successful? No. Because God's plan was not for Jesus to die by being thrown off a cliff. Jesus, God's plan was not for Jesus to die as a little baby in Bethlehem. The Gospel of John tells us, Gospel of John, chapter number 8, Jesus is teaching the synagogues and the Pharisees are so irate at him that they begin to pick up stones to stone Jesus. Does one stone hit Jesus? God's plans cannot be derailed. Now what's God's plan? So Herod wants to kill Jesus. Pharisees warn Herod, he's out to get your head. What's the, what's the rational response to king wants to kill you? Rational response is, I might want to go somewhere else right now. Jesus' response. Tell that fox, pass a message on to Herod, would you? Tell that fox, tell that deceiver, relatively weak animal. I'll just summarize, I'll summarize verse 32 in my own words. I'll leave town when I'm good and ready. Is Jesus afraid that Herod can derail God's plan? No. I have a mission to finish, Jesus says. My mission, I'm going to heal people. I'm going to cast out demons. I got it today. I got it tomorrow. Third day. Now, don't read too much into like the day, tomorrow, third day. Like Jesus is looking at his calendar and like, well, I, looks like to me, day after tomorrow, I'm going to wrap this thing up and get moving. Jesus is just simply saying, I got a short amount of time to finish this up. And then I got to go to Jerusalem. There's so much about this that I just kind of chuckle at. There's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect where Jesus is literally giving Herod his day planner. And say, if you want to kill me, I'll tell you where I'm going to be. I'm going to be here casting out demons. I'm going to be here um, healing people. And then I'm headed down to Jerusalem. Because Jesus knows Herod cannot do anything that will derail God's plan. And God's plan is that Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. God's plan is that Jesus is going to finish the work of delivering people from Satan's bondage by casting out demons. And then verse 33, I must go on my way today, tomorrow, and the day following it. Because prophets die in Jerusalem. If you connect the word must in verse 33, Jesus is saying, I must finish what I'm doing here because I have to go to Jerusalem to die. Now, there's so much irony here. Here's a guy who wants to kill Jesus. Message delivered by Pharisees who want to kill Jesus. And what is Jesus saying, I have to go do? Be killed. But this death is not a death where, where they get to do it on their terms. This is a death that Jesus says, I lay my life down. I sacrifice my life. This death is a death completely within the plan of God from eternity past that he would provide a sacrifice for those he saves to give up forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ's death upon the cross. That's the plan, and Jesus says, that's what I got to do. I must go 
to die. That word must has so much weight. This isn't the must that you or I say at the end of a dinner party when we see we've got to get out of here. We're like, dude, look at the time. I really got to get going. This is I have to. Why must Jesus go die in Jerusalem? Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I must do what my God has authored for me to do. And that is it. So then I got to push and say, well then, why would God author a plan to have his son die a pain-filled death on a cross in Jerusalem? Because God so loved that he sent his only son to die. That God authored a plan that would allow him to still be the just God who punishes sins rightly and also the justifier of everyone who would believe by providing the perfect sacrifice to end all sacrifices. That Jesus would go to Jerusalem to die is the plan. Look at verse number 32. After telling, calling Herod a fox, Jesus says this amazing statement, I have to finish my course. I finish it. From the very beginning, Jesus has been working to finish the plan that God has given to him. Heal, I'm working to finish my course. Cast out demons, I'm working to finish my course. I must go to Jerusalem, I'm going to finish my course. To the point that Jesus hangs upon a cross and declares in victory, it is finished. Was God's plan ever derailed away from enabling to provide for us the gift of salvation? No. My Savior Jesus Christ finished it. Now, Herod couldn't derail the plan of God. Try as he might, he couldn't derail it. And I hope you see the truth and reality that even when Jesus dies upon the cross, it is not a derailment upon, of God's plan. It is God's plan. In fact, the amazing power of God is he will take a foolish ruler like Pilate he will take the sin of these individuals to, to condemn an innocent man to fulfill his perfect plan. He's been doing that from the beginning. But it's not just man's power that cannot derail God's plan. It is also the unbelief that cannot derail God's plan. Now, admittingly, our next two verses are harder. So verse 33, Jesus just said, here, wait a minute here, I got to get to Jerusalem because in Jerusalem I'm going to die. And saying the word Jerusalem, it seems to bring Jesus' memory, loving aspect of Jerusalem. Verse 34. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills prophets and stones those who sent to it, how often I would have gathered you in like a hen does to her, her chicks. But you didn't want it. Jerusalem. Here's the reputation that Jesus says Jerusalem has. Jerusalem the city that kills prophets. Isn't that a great like city motto? <laughs> On the welcome sign, welcome to Jerusalem, the city that kills prophets. But that's the reputation it has. You go through the Old Testament, and you see God sends prophet Zechariah, now stoned outside the temple in Jerusalem. Our best guess, Isaiah, Sawn in two through a hollow log he's laying in, dies in Jerusalem. Nehemiah just simply actually makes this general reference. Jerusalem, you've killed the prophets. So you go throughout history and you have here God's 
chosen people, God's nation. God has given them the law. God has sent the prophets to them. God has done wondrous miracles through them. Yet when God sends a prophet to Israel, what do they do? Nine times out of ten, they reject it and kill it. And it would be easy to say, well, wait a minute then here. God has, God's plan has failed. Here's this nation that by and large does not follow after God. He's got to judge them. Maybe for a generation they come back. They wander back away. He sends a prophet. They kill a prophet. You say, wait a minute here. God's plan's failing. Another prophet dies. God's plan failed. And we know what's going to happen here. Jesus is saying, I've got to go to Jerusalem that's going to continue this long line of prophets sent by God being killed. In fact, Jesus even says, I, 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 I wish I could have, I wish I could have just gathered you in, Israel. I put you under my protective wing. I love you. You could find shelter under my wing. You read the Psalms, you see that concept go over and over again through the psalmists. As you find this, this sheltered comfort under, Jesus, under God's wing. And Jesus is saying, is, I, I wanted to do this to you, but you didn't want it. The mental picture I get is when those moods where I kind of come home and I, I want to give a little kid a hug. We have an 18, well, not 18 month old now. Try to have a hug him yesterday. Man, that kid's strong. Just push away. I'm like, no, come on, let's try to get a cuddle here. No, no. You gotta bribe the kid, okay? I got food, hug me, okay? Now, that's the picture here. Jesus is saying, I. How many times have I called you to repent and I've wanted to gather you together? You didn't want it. You pushed me away. Now, I'm, that is easy at this point to say, wait a minute now. This is what Jesus wants. They don't want it. God's plans failed. I mean, here's king of the Jews. God's plan must have failed. They're going to kill him. In fact, they are going to mock him that he says he's the king of the Jews as they kill him. Think of all the prophecy that God has given to this moment. Abraham, great nation. David, there's coming from your line. Someone's going to sit on the throne forever. Yet here's the promise fulfilled. The person who's supposed to sit on the throne forever is hanging upon the cross dying. But God's plan has not been derailed. Look at verse number 34. 35. Behold, your house is forsaken. Israel, your house, who you are, your nation, is forsaken. And you look at what happens to Israel after this moment, and you see it play itself out. 30 years down the road, 40 years down the road, now Israel will become decimated. But this is not the end. End of verse 35, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There is still a future because God's plan will not be derailed. God's not done. And the unbelief of these people and the rejection of these people in this moment does not derail God's plan. You read Romans 11. God's working his plan right now. He's saying right now I'm bringing people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then Israel, come back up here. Let's finish what I was doing. My plan's not done. All right. That's the passage. One truth. God's plan cannot be derailed. Can we at least nod our heads and say, true? I don't care who the ruler is, can't derail it. I don't care how powerful they are, they cannot derail it. I don't care the unbelief, it cannot derail God's plan. And you could take your Bible and you could, you could throw through a few pages, stick your finger down, and I guarantee you you're pretty close to an account that says God's plan can't be derailed.
but this is where we have some hard work to do now. Because I'm concerned that I can make a statement, God's plan can't be derailed, and we nod our heads, and you say amen, but we leave so much unsaid. So when I say God has a plan, what's one of the first things you want to know when I say God has a plan? What is it? So if you're telling me, Pastor, that God's plan can't be derailed, and we say amen, I want to know what the plan is that's not getting derailed today. And I want to know how me having the world's worst cold this week was part of God's plan not being derailed in my life. And how is me having like the horriblest job part of God's plan for my life not being derailed? And how is me not having anybody in my life right now part of God's plan? And how is me not being married right now part of God's plan? And and how is all this suffering part of God's plan? See, if I make this statement that God's plan cannot be derailed, there's this automatic, automatic response. So what's the plan? And I say this because there's times where we take this concept that God's plan cannot be derailed and we hijack it. See, honestly, there are times where we take our plans and we take God's stamp, imaginary, and plop it upon our plans and say, look, God's plans for my life. Aren't they good? Those aren't God's plans. Maybe. Maybe. We have a really struggle time with this concept of plans for God. I think sometimes when I say God's plan for your life, some of you guys picture, remember the game of life? Remember the game of life? Games have come a long way since the game of life, okay? I play games to get away from life, not experience life. What's fun of playing a game where you can lose your job, not get the job you want, go in debt? Not a fun game. But that game of life, I think sometimes we view God's plan like the game of life. You remember that game? Like, there's like a gazillion different ways you can get through that board. You get up and like, hey, I can go this way or I can go that way. And this way has like college over here, but this has a better job quicker. And like, oh, there's another place I can go like over here. This car could give me like 10 children. And this car can give me one kid. Hmm, which way am I going to go on this one? It's this game of multiple options. And then we think like God's plan is that one best way through the whole maze of the game. And then we live in fear that like way back 20 years ago we took turn A when we were thinking this would be best instead of turn B and we just missed God's whole plan. So when you hear this like statement like God's plan can't be derailed, some of you are actually thinking, well, I think I derailed God's plan a long time ago. Long time ago. Which makes me say then, if we're going to say that God's plans can't be derailed, we better know what God's plans are. So what's God's plan? Well, I already, already kind of gave you the answer in the passage. What must Jesus Christ do in the passage? He must die to make payment for sin so that God's people could be forgiven of sin and have a relationship with God so that they could spend eternity with God. There's the plan. Man, I let it out. So you guys are like, man, the secret's gone. That's the plan. You say, well, pastor, I know that whole plan thing. Yep, Jesus Christ's plan for my life. I get saved. But pastor, that was like, I don't know how many years that was. That was a long time ago, okay? What about God's plan for my life right now? It is still the same plan of the gospel in your life. The plan hasn't changed. God's plan for your life today is still The gospel changing you to be like your Savior, Jesus Christ, to spend eternity with him. That's the plan. God's plan is Christ-likeness. God's plan is holiness. God's plan is sanctification. God's plan is eternity with him forever in heaven. That's the plan. And everything that God does in my life is built off of that plan. And that plan cannot be derailed. This is why why Paul can give the testimony in Philippians 1. The God who's started a good work in me is going to complete it. The plan's going to come to completion. 
is not just Jesus Christ saying it is finished on the cross. He's going to continue to work in my life until I am finished and like my Savior. That's the plan. That means, that means that everything I experienced this past week was not God making a mistake, but was working more and more towards his plan for my life of becoming Christ-like. Now that is easy for my, me to say, but I, but I know some look at their week and say, that sounds cruel. See, there are times where we live in despair when we doubt that God has a good plan. There are times where we go through life and experience things that we would never choose to experience. Never choose to experience. And begin to wonder what God is doing, if anything, in our life. And if he is doing something, how could it possibly be good? Talk to Joseph. He knows that place. Talk to Job. He's been in that place. Apostle Paul? Yeah. When we get to these points where we say, how can this be part of the plan of a good God? And we despair because either we think that God doesn't have a plan or we think that God's plan is not good. Christian, there are times where sometimes we get experience how God's plan plays out and what it does in our life. Joseph lasted long enough to know that. And he, he has lines lasted long enough to where he can give the testimony. You know what? You meant this for evil. God's whole plan here was for good. Whole time. Save a lot of people. God's plan was good. That there are other times where we don't get to know how this all played itself out to be God for God's good plan. Job. Job does not get God to sit back and say, hey, let me tell you exactly what happened here. Let me unpack it all for you. All Job is left with is Job 42 where he simply has to declare, you know what, God? None of your plans can be thwarted. They're your plans. But I think one of our greatest struggles when it comes to God's plan is that even though we profess to love God, even though we say that we are Christian, even though we say we love God's word, we don't share the same plan agenda as God does. So when I say God has a plan, you can say amen, but that doesn't mean you like the plan. We live in rebellion when we love our plan over God's good plan. Growing up, family vacations were epic for our family. My dad would look forward to family vacation. Um, family vacation for us typically meant getting in a, in a car, driving long distances, um, eating cheap food like cheap 99 cent tacos, and then sleeping in tents while it rained and my parents got the pop-up camper. Sounds like a bang-up time, right? There are plenty of family vacations where we, as kids, would, would wake up in the beginning of the day and be like, okay, so what's the plan? What are we going to do today? And dad would have planned out, you know, we're going to go to this museum over here, and then we're going to go walk through Boston. It's going to be like a seven-mile walk and see a bunch of historic sites. And, and then, yeah, this is going to be great. What, what eight-year-old kid wants to do that? That's not the plan I like. And then you guys know, you know, what, you know what dad says then at the end. Luke, this is a family vacation. You're part of the family, so you're going to have fun whether you like it or not. So let's go do my plan. And we go through a day, and there's plenty of days where I don't know. I, I honestly don't know why my dad would even bring me along. Because I made it very clear the whole day, I do not like your plan. And I would have planned something very different for this day on vacation, Dad. So often in my life, it's not that I don't believe that God has a plan for my life. It's that I don't like what God has planned. You say, well, I understand what they're saying because that was a horrible month I've had. No, what I really don't like is I don't want God's plan for me to become more Christ-like, more holy, 
and grow closer to him. And when I don't delight in what God delights in, and when I don't hunger for what God hungers for, I will not find comfort in the fact that God has a plan for my life. In fact, I will either become angry because I don't like it, or I will go off and attempt to find my own plan. And I will fight against it. Christian, if I am saved, I cannot derail God's plan. That's an encouraging thing, but that's also a sobering thing. Because God will not give up on me and continue to bring into my life what it takes to make me like my Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to threaten him, I'm just trying to see this is how my God works. Because his plan can't be derailed. So before we say amen and say, wow, what a good thing, we have to ask, do I actually want what God is planning for my life? Because what God is planning is that he does what he needs to do in my life to cause me to be sanctified, to be holy, to love him, to glorify him, to walk with him, to spend eternity with him. God has a plan. For every single one of you, Christian, God has a plan. I told you what it was. Do I know exactly how it's all going to work out? How does God take his plan, big plan, and play it out in your life? No, I don't know. I know what's happened is part of it. But I don't know what will happen be part of it. And I can take comfort in the fact that my God has this plan where I could rebel against it because I don't love what my God loves. God's plan can't be derailed. In the Garden of Eden, a snake attempted to derail it, Satan. History continues on. God's plan continues on. The sinfulness of mankind attempted to derail it. And God says, it's not going to stop it. I have a plan. Let's start again with eight. And then you keep on reading it. And again, God's plan and people come against it and they disobey God. And God says, you know what? Let's introduce languages. My plan's not going to be destroyed here. And then God puts a plan out. And he calls out a guy named Abram. And the plan continues and he gives him a promise. And Abram is a sinful, unbelieving individual with a wife who is old and laughs at God's promises. Does God's promise plan get derailed? Nope. And God continues on. And through the sinfulness of ten brothers, God takes his plan continuing on through Joseph now in Egypt, and God's plan continues on. And a Pharaoh who says, yeah, right to God's plan, God's plan still isn't derailed. And after a country is decimated, God's plan continues on as a nation is birthed out of plagues. And to fast forward through several hundreds of years, you have a cycle of rebellion, yet God's plan is not being derailed. And you have a cycle of prophets killed, and God's plan is not being derailed. And God's plan continues on. Do you have a baby born in the manger? And heaven explodes with praise. God's plan wasn't derailed. And what God promised way back to Adam and Eve, who have the fresh reality of what sin is in their life, to this moment, God's plan has continued on. But God's plan does not stop at that moment with the baby. And it does not stop at the moment with Jesus Christ is on the cross. That plan continues on to this week in this moment right now. Christian, God's plan in your life to take that death of Jesus Christ, apply it to your account, to give you new life, to transform who you are, to bring you to a point to spend eternity with God, that plan 
will not get derailed this week. It can't. It hasn't since eternity past. It hasn't with all the powers of Satan. It hasn't with, it wasn't with all the powers of mankind coming against it. That plan this week will not get derailed. I'm not saying this week is going to be wonderful. I'm not saying this week is going to be exactly how you would plan it to be. Most likely it won't be. What I'm saying is what God's planned won't get defeated. And if I love God's plan, then I say, amen, God. Because I want your plan in my life. Let's pray. And so, God, we pray. What is a hard reality to face? I simply pray, God, for the work of your word and your spirit in our life to cause us to hunger and love after what you hunger and love after so that we can see your good plan and yearn for it. And give praise as you work in our life moment by moment, day after day, to bring about this one plan in our life. And in your sovereignty and your plan right now, you've seen fit for our life to be right now. And I pray for patience in our life to trust you as we rest in your working in our life. And I pray that we yearn for the day where your plan is completed and we spend eternity with you. Church family, take the moment. Are you encouraged that God's plan won't be derailed today? Or right now, your plan and God's plan are not on the same page. You're going to continue to buck against what God's plan is for your life because you're not desiring what he's desiring. But God's plan is going to win. Father, we thank you for the death of your son. I thank you that you are the author of a perfect plan. I thank you that you're a God who's in control to make your plan come to reality. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.